this is kind of a special opportunity for us. One of the things that I've asked the team to do is to reach out to you, the fans of the World of Darkness, and to start to build bridges as people as opposed to organizations. Uh, I know the history of the CAM and the history of, uh, of White Wolf have not always been on the best of terms, but the people in the CAM and the people at White Wolf have always been able to find common ground. And it's very important to me that on a go-forward basis, you think of us as people that you have a relationship with, not as a company that you have a relationship with. And people like Kelly and Chris and Greg and Shane and the other 400 people who work at CCP definitely want to meet you and get to know what you would like to see from the world of darkness and to help you have more fun pretending to be vampires, which at the end of the day is what we're basically up on the stage trying to do. Uh, let me talk a little bit about myself, just for those of you who don't know me. I'm the guy who publicly said at one point that Vampire the Masquerade is the worst thing that ever happened to the role-playing game industry. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, for a long time, I was very conflicted about uh, Vampire in particular, the World of Darkness in specific. And uh, Shane and I have known each other for at least a decade. And uh, we would have these uh, lengthy arguments, uh, often publicly when we were at conventions, uh, where I would take the position that the World of Darkness was a problem, and Shane would take the position that I was an idiot. Um, <laughs> Well, it, it turns out in the end that I'm an idiot. So um, the argument that Shane made to me uh, uh, about four years ago when we were uh, in a high-rise um, stolen hotel room, I think was, it was the foundation room, that's right, in Vegas, um, which changed my mind about the world darkness and vampire forever was this. Shane argued with me that some number of people are in crisis when they come to the world darkness. They are abused, they are on the streets, they are drug dependent. They don't know where they're going in life. They may be having uh, medical problems. They may just be depressed and unhappy. And then they find Vampire. And often after they find Vampire, they find a group of people to play that game with. And after they find a group of people to play that game with, they often find the Camarilla. And Vampire in some cases saves their lives because it gives them something larger than themselves to believe in. It gives them a community of friends to support them. It gives them an infrastructure they can use to rebuild whatever trauma has afflicted them. And if Vampire and the World of Darkness and the Camarilla saves one person's life, then it obviously can't be the worst thing that ever happened to the role-playing game industry. So, um, when I was given the opportunity to take a job at CCP and to work on World of Darkness, I came to this position very enthusiastically. Um, I am a wholehearted supporter of the World of Darkness. I love Vampire the Masquerade. I think it's a fantastic property. I can't wait to work on it in the future. So this is not a circumstance where some guy in a suit uh, is being asked to take a job running a business that he thinks is dumb or is filled with fat, stupid, lazy people. This is an opportunity for a guy to really take advantage of a unique opportunity to work on something that he truly is passionate about and to work on it with a lot of people that are passionate about it and to work on it for people who are passionate about it. And that's just about the best job anybody could ever have. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit about my bio. I'm not going to go on for 20 minutes. I can hopefully get mine done shorter than Shane can. His is more interesting than mine is, so I'll be shorter. Um, I've been a hobby gamer since I was in the sixth grade. I played Dungeons and Dragons when I was 12 years old. And when I was 12 years old, my father asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up, and I told him that I wanted to publish Dungeons and Dragons. And then I did. I founded a company called Five Rings Publishing Group, and I co-developed a trading card game called Legend of the Five Rings. Thank you. And uh, in, the, in the spring of 1997, that company essentially ran out of money. Uh, the trading card game business, for those of you who don't know, is very, very expensive. And you have to spend a lot of money making cards before you sell them. So it's, can, it's always plagued by cash flow problems. You're always spending more money than you're making. So uh, the team of guys that was learning Five Rings Publishing took a look around the industry and said, what can we do to raise a bunch of cash? And the most obvious thing that came to us was to go down the street to Wizards of the Coast and ask them to buy us. So we did. Um, <laughs> Uh, Peter Atkinson, who at the time was the CEO of Wizards of the Coast, and I are relatively good friends. We actually go back quite a ways to the old role-playing game days when he was publishing Primal Order, and nobody had ever heard of Wizards of the Coast before they became the evil titan that crushed the whole gaming industry. Uh, 
yeah, that was before Hasbro bought them and then crushed them badly under the Pokemon heel. Um, uh, and Peter said to us, well, look, you guys have a great business and we think Legend of the Five Rings is pretty good, but you're basically worth nothing, so we would never buy you. Why don't you go out and find something more valuable that you can bring to us that would make us interested in purchasing your company? So the guy that we had hired to run Five Rings Publishing was a guy named Bob Abramowitz. And Bob came to me and said, what is the most valuable asset we could acquire in the hobby game industry? And I said, well, we should probably just go get D&D, which I was completely joking about. I thought that was a ridiculous suggestion. So uh, Bob, who doesn't know any better, and often really great things happen when you're dumb and you don't know any better, starts making phone calls. And it turned out that TSR was completely fucked. Um, <laughs> they, they were essentially bankrupt and uh, desperately needed a white knight to come in and rescue them. But the owner at the time was too proud to ask for help. She is the granddaughter of the guy who created or self-financed uh, the Buck Rogers franchise. And in her family, asking for someone else to invest in your business is simply not done. So because she was afraid to ask for help, she let the bills pile up and pile up and pile up. And they finally got to the point where it was going to kill the company. So we went out to, to meet them. and. Um, Bob locked himself in a room with her for about three hours, and when he came out of that room, he had an offer in paper, an option to buy TSR at a fixed price. So we got on a plane and flew back to Seattle, and Bob calls up Peter and he says, Peter, I want you to lend me a million dollars. And Peter says, Bob, there is nothing on this planet that you have that I would be willing to win, lend you a million dollars to fund. And Bob says, well, Peter, what's your fax number? And uh, he faxed... He faxed him the cover sheet of the option to buy TSR, and Peter called him right back and said, well, a company check due? <laughs> and that's how I bought TSR, <laughs> with Peter's money. <laughs> so after the deal went through, uh, Five Rings Publishing was rolled into that acquisition, and we all moved down to Renton into new offices at, uh, at, at Wizards of the Coast. And uh, I moved into a group called New Brand Development and Licensing. And at the time, my boss was a guy named Rich Fukutaki, who became very important to me and is my personal mentor. And he taught me a lot about business, and he taught me a lot about life. Rich is the guy who wondered why it was that sales of Magic the Gathering in Japan were increasing in 1998, even though sales of Magic worldwide were flat or declining. And he sent a team of guys over to Japan to try and get to the bottom of that and figure out what was going on. And they came back and they said, well, this is what's going on. There's a whole other trading card game industry in Japan that we don't know anything about. And they're selling a lot more cards than we're selling. And Magic isn't even the biggest game over there. The biggest game over there is this thing called Pokemon. So, so Rich says, okay, well, let's, let's check that out. Let's get those cards over here and let's see what the deal is. And they were all in Japanese, of course, so that had to be translated. And it became obvious pretty quickly that Pokemon and Magic were basically the same game. Um, but the Pokemon brand was a little bit better managed, and it was run by Nintendo, which is a much bigger company than Wizards of the Coast, so it had pretty good potential. And Nintendo was talking about bringing that business to the United States. So Rich decided we were going to license Pokemon, and that uh, Wizards of the Coast was going to be the Pokemon publisher. And he went out, and he basically got a deal negotiated, and uh, agreed on the terms, and paid them the initial royalty payment, brought that all back, and uh, brought it to a board meeting, and told the board what we were going to be doing, and then Peter basically fired him. <laughs> because Peter didn't want to publish a trading card game designed by Nintendo in Japan that was basically just like Magic, but wasn't. Um, but the deal was already done, and getting out of it at that point would have been very difficult. So the company decided to go ahead and make Pokemon, even, even though Peter didn't really want to do it. Um, uh, that was 1998. In 1999, uh, Dungeons and Dragons generated about $20 million in revenue worldwide. And Magic the Gathering generated about $150 million in revenue worldwide. And Pokemon generated $800 million in revenue worldwide. <laughs> and then Hasbro bought us. And that was awesome for my wallet. Um, somewhere along there, Peter came to me and he said, uh, we're basically done with all these little trading card games you guys are making. They're successful and all, but um, we need you to do something else. We had a huge problem with D&D. Um, and since you're basically responsible for us buying the company, we kind of think you need to fix it. So I looked at him and I said, Peter, are you telling me you want me to take over the D&D &D business? And he says, yes, I'm telling you you have to take over the D&D 